just consume 10 minutes of my talk, so we're going to go really quick. Okay. Hopefully I've had enough coffee to move through this. Hey, uh, it's really good to be here, really good to see you, and frankly, it's good to be seen, because uh, doing a meeting, speaking to a group on a computer screen is just awful. I'd really rather see it here in person, and I'm glad you took time out of your schedule to spend some time with us today. So I'm going to talk about a subject that may make some of us a little... Mom? 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 Is that my It is. It could have been. Uh, this subject may make some of us uncomfortable, and uh, hopefully I can do it with a little bit of humor so that it's not too uncomfortable. Uh, but trust me when I say I've seen a lot of mistakes over the years. Uh, I think I've made my living um, passing on the information I saw from my own and lots of other folks' mistakes. Uh, and this is kind of the culmination of the peculiar things and the maybe dysfunction of some of the Green Committee, um, Green Committees I've worked with and observed over the years. So thanks to my uh, MGA friends for uh, setting this whole meeting up, especially Kevin. Um, thanks also for my old USJ friends for attending and participating. Uh, and I'll reference some of the great work they've done and continue to do uh, in just a minute or two. Uh, I'm not going to spend much time on the function of the committee because uh, you can read about it. And uh, that last line on the slide there, Tools for Green Committees, is a wonderful digital collection of articles that the USGA has available. So you can Google Tools for Green Committees, throw in USGA, I guarantee you'll find it. There's a ton of really good information there on the function of the Green Committee. In, in very simple terms, I think of the Green Committee as um, an advocate, a group of individuals that advocate for the golf course. And um, they're a buffer, a very much needed buffer between golfers uh, and the superintendent. Um, superintendents get too much uh, uh, information from golfers all the time. It's amazing how many graduate agronomists play golf and, and you know, <laughs> share their opinions and factual advice that they read on the internet um, uh, all the time. And that buffer is really helpful. Uh, but there are a lot of ways to do it effectively, be a committee member effectively, and a lot of ways not to. I'm going to show you some of the not to's today, but how to's look for this article. It's, it's uh, those articles, I should say. In, in the most simplistic terms, man, the job of the committee is to protect the golf course from the golfers because they've got some crazy ideas. We've all heard some of them, and um, um, you just don't want them to be trying their crazy ideas under your watch. It'll turn into chaos and disaster. Um, a word of wisdom. Playing golf for years and watching it all the time on television does not qualify you to be an expert in golf course management, turf grass management. Um, and I've heard suggestions to this effect many times. Dave, I've been playing golf all my life. I know good greens, and when I see them, and these aren't good greens. Okay, you may have a problem with your greens, or you may have a butt problem with your putting ability. Uh, it's amazing how many people that putt poorly have the most green complaints. Uh, it's, I don't know, it's a coincidence. There's a bunch of do's and don'ts, a very short list. Be a listener. That's probably the most important thing for, a, frankly, a consultant, but also most importantly for Green Committee members. Listen to your superintendent. He or she has a wealth of knowledge and experience to share with you. You just need to take a deep breath and listen. And don't be that person that's just listening for the opening where they can get their jab at or their comment or their recommendation or their observation or whatever. Listen and, I, and digest. Don't judge until you've done that. Don't start all your sentences with I. I used to visit with a chairman. Oh my gosh, I had to ride with him. And the whole visit was a litany of, look, Dave, I took all those trees out you mentioned last year. And Dave, I reworked the water source over here after we talked about it last year. And I looked at the guy's 75, okay? I'm, I'm not there yet, but even at 65, I couldn't have taken out all those trees, okay? Um, he did not do that. His superintendent did with his support but he did not direct it, and he sure as hell didn't do it. Uh, so don't start your sentences with I. It's we and our superintendent. By the way, it's not my superintendent either. Uh, don't compare courses. I'm going to talk more about that in just a moment. So ideal chairman, man, listener, no ego. That pretty much lets all of us out of the, out of the room right there. 
open-minded, willing to room to, to learn, that probably disqualifies a few of us as well. Um, collaborator and communicator and a team player. Uh, patience, because it's an old, old adage, but a, a, a former national director of the USGA said many years ago, the only thing that happens fast is in agronomy is crop failure. So you gotta be patient for that grass to grow sometimes or programs to work. Um, willing to work long hours for sure, tough, divisive, and decisive, uh, not divisive, by the way. Um, and it really helps to uh, have a, a sense of humor and warped seems to work better than not. And a thorough understanding of Murphy's Law because they play such a critical role in everything golf course management related. For instance, the year you put in an irrigation system, I promise you it'll be the wettest summer on record. It just always works that way. Um, here's a tip for Green Committee chairman and members. Um, wear hearing aids. You don't have to put batteries in them or anything, but that makes it easier to ignore those stupid and maybe silly, inopportune comments uh, and, and bits of advice as you're trying to play a game of golf. And by the way, if you're a new committee member, recognize that some of your playing, uh, your, your competitors, if they realize that they can get in your head by making a comment about a boy a seed head or a divot or a Walmart, they're going to do it. Your handicap's going up. So I. Just use those hearing aids. The truth is, being on a committee, green committee, can be really fun, really re rewarding, because you can leave the course better than you found it. And frankly, it's an opportunity to learn a, about a lot of things, but certainly uh, for your purposes, maybe, about the game of golf and the impact golf um, has on your course and the impact your course has on the environment, which Brian Morgan uh, Dr. Horgan's going to talk about after me in a few minutes, and you're going to be blown away by this presentation as well. So without any more ado, I want to get to the top ten. We're counting down, and uh, this is where I might see a little squirming in the, in the chairs out there. Um, but this list was actually compiled a number of years ago by my former USJ colleagues. Um, I sent a quick email out to the entire staff, and I said, hey, what do you think the top ten um, Green Committee mistakes are? And holy cow, that was like a button. It was like a bomb going off. Um, I got faxes, I got emails, I got texts. Um, it was cathartic. Guys vented for pages about the silly things they had seen. And the effort in writing that article actually became paring down all the ideas into the top 10. It was, it was quite a job. So this is one that's quite common. Um, it was more common years ago, but it still is. Uh, and that's shopping for the right opinion. So you don't like the messenger, you shoot him or you find another messenger. Um, you know, when you have a bad grain, it's usually surrounded by trees. It doesn't have good airflow. It doesn't have good traffic flow. And that's a nice place for a picnic area, but not a very good place for a putting green. And so you've got to implement some solutions that may be objectionable to some of your golfers to fix this, to make it work. Uh, so it could be an above ground environment or maybe the soils under your greens are terrible. Uh, you've got some sand on top with too much organic matter, thatch. You've got clay down below. They play well when moisture levels are just right, but um, too dry and they're hard as brick bats, too wet, they become a water hazard. Um, when these problems, these are all solvable problems. Um, and when a consultant comes in, whether it's USGA friends or me or whomever, if they tell you you've got to do something disruptive, maybe it's cutting trees down or um, um, you know doing disruptive aeration work, don't shoot the messenger, don't fire the messenger, do what they do what they say. And if someone comes in and says, well, you know, we don't want to do that, um, I've got another consultant that says we can do this and that'll be just fine. Fire that consultant. Okay. Um, I've heard this many times over the years from as far north as um, a course named Idlewild, which is four hours north of Toronto, uh, down to Virginia Beach. Uh, Dave, you don't understand. We've got a short season. We can't do that stuff. Well, yes, you can, and you need to. And so these are those dis disruptive types of observations that you may need to do if you've got these kinds of soil problems. Uh, so don't shoot the consultant. Listen to them. They're going to it's in their best interest for you to be successful. They're not giving you 
programs and practices to aggravate your golfers. It's just paying your dues so you can have better and more reliable turf. Um, and this is where those hearing aids come in again. This is a, a special model. Um, I, I, I have a line on these if anybody needs a pair. Uh, it's uh, David Otis Consulting uh, LLC name. So. Um, and don't look for the quick fix. Um, I am a, an admirer of the creativity people uh, use when using duct tape to fix certain things. But there are certain things that should be fixed quickly and a number of things that should be fixed with duct tape at all. Number nine, not enough time, which really is a, a, a polite way of saying not being committed to doing the job of a, an effective committee member or chairman. And it's really an important job. It needs your attention. It needs your effort. If you don't have the time, you know, maybe you can't do it. But it does take time to do it well. And, and those types of people say things like, nah, I don't care about that agronomic stuff. I just want to play golf. Well, I understand that. Then you should disenroll yourself from the committee, sir. Um, it takes time to do it well. It's not an exorbitant amount of time, but it takes time and commitment. And the fact that many of you are here today is testimony to your commitment. That's, that's terrific. Um, but you don't want to see this all too common scenario. So I, I visited courses with the USGA for 32 years, and um, this happened frequently over the years. You know, 12 people are in, invited to the visit, and the agronomist is coming out from the golf house, and we're going to talk about all these things, and eh, three are unavailable right off the bat. That's not a big deal. It's understandable. Um, and there's three last-minute cancellations, maybe because they got an invitation to play a pretty cool course down the road. Uh, there's always a couple of no-shows. Mm, hard to know. Could have been business. Could have been more golf invitations. You get four people there ultimately, and you're very excited, but you realize, oh my gosh, two of them are late, and then a couple of them leave early. And there goes all that money and time your superintendent is spending to bring in somebody to really educate the committee uh, on the very specific issues related to your golf course. So the point here is don't be that committee member that doesn't have time, that has maybe time to play golf, but doesn't have time to be on the committee and to do it effectively. Figurehead chairman, I don't think this is so common anymore, but I certainly have seen it many times over the years. This is where the chairman isn't a member of the board. And on the surface, it may sound fine. Uh, the new president uh, appoints a chairman of the Green Committee. The problem is it, it may be a one-year term, which is uh, another point I'll address in a minute, but he or she doesn't have the leverage, doesn't have the knowledge, and certainly doesn't have the influence to push through important programs to be a really effective advocate for the for the golf course or the turf grass management programs so um, and, and if things get dicey between the the president and the green chairman you just fire them and you get somebody new and when that happens in the middle of the season it's just a mess the superintendent is left holding back well this guy told me we wanted to do this and now the new chairman is saying whatever, it's, it's not a good situation. So the Green Committee Chairman really should come from the, from the Board of Directors. A micromanager, Ooh, now every superintendent in the room is starting to cringe because you know where I'm going with this one. This is the committee chairman that plays golf on Saturday, Sunday, two rounds, maybe three or four, and he's got a yellow legal size pad and he's taking notes. And Monday morning, uh, you either get a text, an email, maybe it's Sunday night, or he's in your office, and uh, you got a list of to-dos. Hey, what about them? There's trash in the fence. There's weeds coming out of the cart path over on. There's weeds in the flower bed on another hole. And what about the ball marks? Oh, my gosh. Um, don't be a micromanager. The superintendent. Um, uh, oh, and by the way, they often start this uh, Monday morning conversation. With, Here's what I need you to do. Okay, well, that's not how it works. Um, some of the concerns might really be valid. Um, some might be self-serving, and um, sometimes they're just pet peeves. Um, if you see a pattern of all of the problems being 250 yards from the tee in the left rough, you can probably assume there's a little bit of self-servingness going on. Uh, the, the, some of the comments are, are valid. Um, 
and it's certainly a great thing to ask questions as a chairman. That's the key. Ask questions about these things. Hey, why are we seeing so many weeds in the rough? Why are we seeing um, untrimmed turf? Well, it's a labor situation, or uh, geez, we, we can't get uh, pesticides out, herbicides out because of X, Y, or Z. Maybe we need a new sprayer. Who knows? It could be a million different things. And don't bother spending time about on Walmart. So I'll get to that just in a second. But keep in mind that every superintendent has a list of to dos that's longer than our arms. And uh, there are not enough hours in the day. We're certainly not having enough labor to get everything we'd like to get done these days. Um, but there are priorities that have to be followed. Uh, properly timed pesticide applications. You know, if you don't get the pre-emerge out, we're going to have crabgrass in August. So the reason I can't get to whatever your pet peeve or project would be in the spring is, holy cow, these pesticide apps have to go out, period. Um, so you're not privy to that priority list, but keep a list, ask questions, um, and have a, have a constructive dialogue. Um, and don't go worrying about the ball marks. I am convinced that aliens are causing these because every golfer I know fixes five or more per green without exception, and they still appear. So it's got to be happening in the middle of the night by uh, UFOs, you know, ETs, whatever. It's, it, ball marks are a thing to ask a question about. Don't get all riled about. It's a universal problem. Um, asking questions about the weak turf on the left side of that hole, um, noting that it is shaded, that could have some bearing on the uh, conditions there. Those are good things. Ask questions, get answers, and figure out how we can go forward and improve things in the future. Unrealistic demands, that might be the ultimate uh, problem and the longest one running over the years. Um, everyone has a level of expectation in terms of the golf course, how it should play, how it should look. Um, um, but courses are innately different, you know, up above ground um, and below ground. You know, that pile of rocks is pretty impressive. That came from an irrigation system installed in a golf course in New Jersey a number of years ago. That's all the rocks that were removed while the uh, irrigation lines were installed. They had to be trenched that course because there were so many rocks they couldn't pull in the pipe. Um, so when you start comparing courses, you're comparing things that you know nothing about. Um, it could be below ground conditions. Maybe it's the, the clay soils I showed you on the putting green a couple of minutes ago, or rock forever, you know, throughout the golf course. Um, maybe it's the golf course features. That's a pretty cool bunker, uh, but geez, think about that. That's got to be fly mode once, twice a week. Uh, that's a lot, a lot of labor to get into that, to maintain bunkers like that. If it's one, eh, no big deal. If you've got a bunch of those, it really increases your labor um, and it makes your course more difficult, more challenging, more um, expensive to maintain. So you've got below ground features, above ground features, topography, the number of trees, the acreage, um, many, many things that go into um, how expensive and how difficult a facility is to maintain. So when you compare budgets between courses, that's a really frustrating thing because line items tend to be very different and costs are, are, are accounted for very differently. And same thing with maintenance of the courses. So course A on this side of the street versus B on the other side of the street can have totally different conditions and maybe very different designs and therefore require very different maintenance practices uh, and programs. So, um, you know, if flowers are the priority, hey, that's fine. Don't worry so much about the playability. Um, if the opposite is true, if playability is the, the priority, don't worry about the flowers. And that's really important to think about as uh, when you're on the Green Committee and the Chairman. What are you most worried about? What are you most focused on? You're an advocate for the golf course. Think greens, tees, fairways first and out from there. Flowers are uh, not on a list that many of us would suggest spending a lot of focus on, at least on the golf course. Wants to leave a legacy. Now, who doesn't want to leave the world better, the, the golf course certainly better uh, when they leave? I certainly do. Uh, and I think Green Chairman come on with a, a big heart of gold. And they want to make the course better. In some cases, uh, they want to leave a legacy that maybe not be a 
not, not a good one to leave. Uh, this is a great old course in southern Canada, and the chairman wanted to leave a legacy, and boy did he. Uh, so we got this tree. It's uh, That's a hickory tree. It's a really cool tree, but as you might guess, it's a nut-bearing tree, and it's right next to a fairway, and it's also on a very cool and very strategic mound. So logistically think, hickory nuts fall down, they roll down the hill right into the fairway. Fairway mowers are not happy with this with this tree. Uh, it's costing you money, costing them money. Um, and then from the playability paint standpoint, it's a disaster. Um, it really affects the, the short hitters, the higher handicappers, and has really no impact on the strong players. Don't know what he was thinking there. It's really a cool tree. Now it's too big to, to relocate, so it's got to be removed. Um, but it's the exact type of feature you don't want on a golf course. Uh, it's the high handicappers. Basically, it's now a three-shot par four, and for the strong players, it's a drive and a, and a short wedge, a foot wedge. The legacy you want to leave is one of better turf, less thatch, better drainage, better infrastructure, a sound foundation of turf, and supporting sound agronomic programs and the right priorities for Improving the golf course and how it plays, that's the type of legacy to focus on. Unable to make tough decisions. I think we've almost gotten past the tree issue in terms of tough decisions. I hear stories now about, oh my gosh, I just took down 2,000 trees. But let me tell you, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, it was an act of Congress to take down a tree. And all trees were good because they were trees. I think we've gotten past that, as I said, um, but there are lots of difficult decisions to make as a, as a Green Committee member. And the key is in focusing on what's good for the majority and what's good for the golf course, not what's good for your game um, and individuals. Um, the one the individual that doesn't have the, the uh, fortitude to stand up and fight golfers won't allow proper cultivation programs to be implemented, you're not going to have the playability you want. You're, uh, if you skip an aeration one time, it has little impact on turf health. If you underdo or postpone aeration and other vital programs and practices, uh, it has a cumulative effect that will cause you problems down the road. So tough decisions, yeah, it used to be tree work, now it's probably more uh, maybe cultivation infrastructure needs. It's hard to talk folks into spending several million dollars on something they can't see, like an irrigation system. And boy, do they get a give a reaction when, after spending three or five or whatever million dollars on a new irrigation system, they see staff out there with hoses the next summer. You know, that just blows their mind. We still need hoses even if we have a really good irrigation system. Maintenance facilities, that's an area that we're still lacking at in many golf courses. Part of the difficulty in attracting laborers to some courses has to go back to the maintenance facilities because you don't even want to walk in some of them because they're so inadequate, maybe unsafe, et cetera, et cetera. So making tough decisions, not for what you want, but what benefits the majority is a key. Uh, don't try to please everybody. Do your, get your information, do your research, get with your superintendent, figure out what the best course forward is, and then damn the torpedoes. I will say this, I've said it many times, but nothing significant, no major renovation, no new maintenance facility, no new irrigation, none of those great things that are desperately needed are going to happen at most clubs unless the committee stands up, pounds the table and says, we gotta do this, and sometimes that miss means risking friendships and taking a lot of arrows. Um, you can take comfort in the fact that after you've gone through all that grief, got the, the new irrigation system, taking the trees out, what have you, all the naysayers are going to come up and say, yeah, this is a great program. I'm so glad we backed this, you know, from, I was on your side from day one. Yeah, right, okay. Fails to represent all golfers. Okay, how is your, what's the composition of Green Committee? Is it all male? All under 30, under 40? Uh, is it all older folks? Is it a mixed bag of all different types of golfers? Male, female, good players, not so good players. That's the key. It's very difficult to step out of one's own type of golf game, your own opinion.
ability and see the course through another type of player's eyes. It's, it's, it's just not easy to do, and so that's why you need all types of golfers represented on your committee. It also is valuable as a communication aid. You need somebody to talk to the short hitters, the high handicappers, uh, the older guys, the, the women, you name it. We need to communicate what we're doing, we have a plan, we're implementing it. That will make the committee more effective and more successful. So too large is no good. It was suggested many years ago uh, that committee members should be an odd number, less than three, um, and that works very well on occasion, but you gotta have the right individual, and you kinda have to have the right membership for that to work. Uh, but don't get a group of people that all think alike. Uh, you know, it's not that you wanna spend every meeting organized, uh, arguing, but you need different perspectives, and keep in mind that may not sound like this, but being on a committee should be fun, it can be fun, you have to work to make it fun, which is goes back to one of my early points about that warped sense of humor and understanding of Murphy's laws. Um, but keep in mind that the course that you think is so brutally difficult that you love, you know, you like making bogeys, I don't know, um, that's not the course that most of your members probably will enjoy playing. But one of the great trends I think in golf in the last 20 years is we've softened and tried to widen fairways, softened the edges on our courses, made them more uh, enjoyable in my view by making them wider, uh, removing some trees and having healthier turf and uh, making them more equitable for players of lesser abilities, which uh, I'm in that group now. So, uh, uh, you know, the course that you think is awesome because it's really tough, you're, most of your golfers aren't really going to like it. They may say so, uh, but most of the time get them in a, in a weak moment or maybe after a glass of wine, they'll probably tell you, no, it's, it's supposed to be fun. And Ross said that in his book, you know, decades and decades ago, it should be a pleasure, not a penance. And I think we're doing, putting more fun back in our golf courses with the many changes in recent years, but we should keep going in that direction. Short tenure, holy cow. Um, and I've seen, visited a few courses where the Green Committee serves one year and he or she doesn't come from the committee. So they walk in cold, they stay for a year, and then they're out the door. And talk about a waste of everyone's time and money. They're totally ineffective. So the best thing they can do in that situation is turn to the superintendent and say, yeah, do whatever you want because I don't have enough information to really make any um, good decisions and don't have enough time to um, develop any long range plan. So, um, a longer term is really advisable. If you have a really good chairman, uh, you want to keep him for a really long time. When you have a lousy chairman, yeah, you get that one year, ten, uh, ten years is really good in those situations. Um, it takes several years to learn enough and to come, enough, come to enough of these meetings to acquire enough information to really become an effective member. And by the way, the, the folks that stay on committees for five and ten and sometimes longer um, periods of time become a tremendous asset. They know the history of how we came to get to this position. We know why we planted this tree or took out these trees or what have you. Um, so former committee members that have been valuable contributors, you want to hang on to them uh, and, and keep accessing because they've acquired so much information, some of it no one else may have, and it may not all be written down. Um, so um, having continuity is important, and having new members on every year, and keeping some members every year, and having the chairman come from the committee is a really good way to ensure consistent and long-term improvement and continuity, um, and avoiding that duct tape quick fix uh, mentality. This is sort of a depressing quote from uh, C.D. McDonald, or Alistair McKenzie, actually. Uh, he wrote it in The Spirit of St. Andrews, which is a wonderful book, by the way. Um, you can get it on Amazon. Uh, it's a very quick read, and uh, he wrote it, and uh, the manuscript sat in a trunk for, I don't know, 80 years, and somebody found it, his great nephew or something, and published it. It's a little repetitive, but it's a wonderful read uh, for a super kind of a green committee you want spirit scanners. But uh, he had sort of a, a dim view of committees, you know. Uh, they're appointed, they make mistakes, and just as they're trying to start to figure things out, they resign and are replaced by other people who make those mistakes and others, and on it goes. So um, that continuity.
continuity really is aimed at solving this type of problem. It's obviously an old one. Number one, poor communication. Holy cow, this takes a lot of different forms. Um, the seagull manager, you know, the guy that flies in on Monday morning, and yells and squawks and makes a lot of noise, craps on everybody and then flies out. That's uh, one type of management that doesn't really work in any business I know of, uh, but certainly not as a green chairman. Uh, is that bad listener that I mentioned a little bit ago, the one that just listens for that opening to interject his, uh, his comment or her comment. Um, unavailable, you know, the things are going south, we got a problem and ah, he's not answered his phone. Oh, he's, he's in Bermuda, okay, uh, that's a problem. Um, tries to represent the superintendent at board meetings. Okay, we've got a complex problem. We have an old failing irrigation system. We need a new one. Can the green chairman really adequately explain what's going to happen if we don't replace it, what we're dealing with right now, and why it's so important to start planning and, and get this one on the books to replace it? Um, some can, but you're, when you get the question, you're going to get stumped. So the superintendent really should uh, be present and represent him or herself to the board um, most of the time, but certainly when there's anything um, big uh, in the offering and program of one time or another. Um, poor communication, maybe just not giving good guidelines. Um, and there's ways to get around that. I, on the very first image I think I showed you, uh, there are maintenance guidelines. Um, getting together with the superintendent, realistically the superintendent does the maintenance guidelines and then the committee can on them, so it's not like I'm giving the committee a big job, I'm giving the superintendent a big job, but I think most probably have them already, but it's just a, a target document on how the course is to be maintained, the playability goals, the targets, they're not specifications. Um, that can get around some of this stuff, but uh, um, having made clear expectations, um, yeah, let's review the maintenance guidelines, maybe upgrade them, update them, change them. Uh, but arbitrarily making changes, we want X, Y, or Z, just doesn't make very good sense. And it's got to be clear, and it's got to be a, a two-way discussion with the superintendent. Yes, we'd like to do what you're asking, but we don't have X, Y, or Z. It's not making excuses, we just don't have the capabilities. Um, so working out together uh, what the guidelines are and what the expectations are is a critical aspect of effective communication. Uh, and then not telling the membership that you're going to do extra cultivation or going to remove trees or what have you. Uh, people, smart people belong to clubs that play golf um, and generally speaking, they usually don't like to be treated like mushrooms. Uh, they may argue with programs, uh, but if you've got logic behind it and, and instruct them, educate them as to why different programs are needed, they'll accept it. They may not <coughs> like it, but they'll at least accept it. A favorite old saying, we've all heard this, when a fool learns from his own mistakes, but I think this is much more accurate to say that only a fool learns from his own mistakes. A wise man learns from the mistakes of others. And I think I said this earlier, but that's kind of how I've made my living for the last 30-some years. Um, that's the intent of this uh, presentation. Um, please look for the articles on the Green Section website, the USJ website. Tools for the Green Committee, um, and find them on Google either either way. Um, and then think about how you can effectively work with your superintendent. Don't always start that sentence with I. Be that good listener. Set goals jointly, uh, and never direct the superintendent how to get the job done. Just talk about how what we want to get done, and then let him or her figure it out. Meet during normal uh, working hours and appreciate that the superintendent uh, has their own personal lives. It's a, it's a very difficult job. They put a lot, a lot of hours in meeting on Saturday afternoon, Sunday afternoon, Sunday morning. That's not fair. Uh, and then ultimately, remember that Mother Nature has the, the last word on everything. Many thanks. I'm going to turn it back over to Mr. Donnelly.